Uh, welcome, everyone. We are going to get started in just a minute, uh, a couple minutes. So if you are uh, joining us, welcome. And please uh, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat with your name and organization or, or where you're call, uh, joining us from. Again, welcome everyone uh, to our uh, webinar today. Uh, if you have not yet done so, please introduce yourself in the chat with your name and uh, where you're joining us from or your organization. Welcome everyone. We're going to get started in just a minute, uh, but in the meantime, if you can introduce yourself in the chat with your name and where you're calling from or your organization. Thank you. All right, I think we're uh, going to go ahead and, and get started today. Uh, thank you to everyone for joining us. Uh, we have a lot to cover, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Benjamin Orr. I'm the president and CEO of the Maryland Center on Economic Policy. I apologize that I'm off video, but I'm uh, having some internet trouble today. Uh, but I really appreciate everyone for joining us for this really important conversation. Uh, I also wanna thank the Kaiser Family Foundation for their support of this webinar series. Uh, my, I, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, for those of you who don't uh, know our, the Maryland Center on Economic Policy, uh, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank that believes every Marylander should be able to achieve their full potential in a healthy economy that offers a widely shared and rising standard of living. And uh, we're so happy to have the opportunity to have this conversation today. Uh, I am going to introduce our moderator. Uh, Dr. Siobhan Laird is a board member of the Maryland Center on Economic Policy. She's also Director of Community Health Impact for Bon Secours Mercy Health. Uh, we'll kick off this conversation in just a moment. Uh, we do plan to leave plenty of time to respond to your questions at the end. Uh, if you are joining us on Zoom, you can submit them at any time using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please do note that this webinar is being recorded uh, and you will receive the recording and other materials via email afterwards. With that, uh, I will hand things to Siobhan. 
Thanks so much, Ben. It's a pleasure to be a part of this of this series. Um, I really want, want to make sure that we save time for our individual speakers um, to say what they have to say, because what they have to say is the most important thing today, and as well to get to any questions that participants have. Um, today's um, webinar is on equitable access to care. Access to care is a very um, multifaceted um, topic. It's Some people see it as insurance access. Some people see it as having a provider who can communicate effectively with you. Um, fortunately, we've got a panel um, of guests that um, can provide a multitude of perspectives on this topic. Um, so we will jump right into it. So we're hoping, um, there may be some technical difficulties, but we're hoping that Connie um, Portillo will be able to join us. She is the research and policy analyst at CASA. But I will um, jump to um, Vinnie DeMarco, Vincent DeMarco, who is the president of Maryland's Citizens uh, Health Initiative. His pronouns are he and him. The Maryland Healthcare for All Coalition is made up of hundreds of faith, labor, business, community, and healthcare organizations across the state working to win quality, affordable healthcare for all Marylanders. Vincent DeMarco is a longtime advocate for public health causes, including reducing teen smoking and underage drinking, making prescription drugs more affordable, and furthering health equity. Um, Penny, would you like to say a few words? Yes, thank you uh, very, very much um, to the economic policy uh, folks and to Siobhan for um, being our moderator. Uh, our organization is committed to quality, affordable health care. Uh, for all Marylanders. And we've made a lot of progress in Maryland. We're the fifth best state in the country in providing health care to people. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more later about how we're going to uh, build on that in, in Maryland. But the point I want to make is that one of our number one priorities is reducing health disparities, improving health equity all across uh, Maryland. And we have made some significant progress in that direction this year in the General Assembly, which we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit on how we're gonna implement that. Well said, looking forward to that. Um, next, I will introduce Kat Rogers, who is Director of Community Health Initiatives for the Title Health Healthcare System. Her pronouns are she and her. In this role, she leads strategies to improve population health on the rural Delmarva Peninsula with special focus on the lower eastern shore of Maryland and Sussex County, Delaware. She has a diverse experience in coalition building, provider relations, leadership, and public health in infrastructure. Kat is a Mississippi native who graduated from the University of Colorado in Boulder with a Bachelor of Science in Journalism, News Editorial, and a Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy. She holds a Master of Public Health from the University of Maryland College Park. Kat, any words of introduction? Sure, thank you so much, Dr. Laird, for inviting me to participate on this panel. I'm very excited to uh, be able to share our experiences on the Eastern Shore uh, with people across the state of Maryland and beyond uh, and talk about how uh, we can all work together to advance health equity and how we better serve our friends, families, and neighbors. Thank you for that. And next, we'll move on to Isabel Atrezian, I want to make sure she <laughs> repeats it so she says it correctly. Um, community School Coordinator, Child First Authority. Her pronouns are she, her, and hers. The mission of Child First Authority, if you're unfamiliar, is to develop youth and strengthen families by providing high quality community schools, after school, and summer learning programs that promote academic achievement, social and emotional well being, and parent leadership. Child First Authority is the lead agency for 10 community schools throughout Baltimore City. Isabel works to support the community school strategy at Dorothy, Dorothy I. Height Elementary in Reservoir Hill. Isabel? Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this panel. I very much look forward to talking about access to healthcare with you all. Um, I would just add that if anyone is less than familiar about community school strategies, um, it's an approach to addressing the needs of a school community and supporting the vision of a school community that has been identified by that school community um, by bringing resources and partnerships and programs into the school itself. So making the school a resource hub for the community. So I look, I look forward to talking about healthcare through that lens. That'll be great. I'm definitely looking forward to that part of the conversation. 
So why don't we start out with some, some general statements about access to care. So many people in the United States don't have access to healthcare services or the information they need to make decisions about their health. I think the place to start with today's conversation is to talk a little bit about why access to healthcare is linked to better health outcomes. Um, can our panelists speak today to any research or other evidence linking the two? We'll start with uh, Benny DeMarco. Yes, thank you. Th there have been many studies over the years showing that um, uh, pe when people have more better access to healthcare coverage, health outcomes improve all across the line. And that's been true. And we've seen great evidence of that since the Affordable Care Act uh, under President Obama expanded health care to 20 million Americans, 400,000 Marylanders. Health uh, outcomes have improved uh, for everyone. And the most recent study directly showing how um, health coverage works is the fact that Maryland is the sixth best vaccination rate for COVID in the nation the six best. And when reporters ask me why, I say one of the reasons is because we fully implement the Affordable Care Act and have one of the lowest uninsured rates in the country. We need to do better, but because of what we've done in Maryland so far, we have things like the six best vaccination rate in the country, and we're going to improve on that. Thanks. Definitely a go Maryland moment, for sure. A moment to be proud. Um, next, we'll check, check in with Kat. Kat? Yeah, um, so I bring a little bit different perspective because I come from a, a local health system in a rural part of the state of Maryland and also serving parts of Delaware. And um, access is, is one of the biggest problems that we face in providing um, care and in health outcomes and health disparities. We know that social determinant of health factors such as education, economics, environmental can drive 80% of health outcomes versus medical care. And so these barriers and challenges associated and related to social determinants of health, um, they can really exacerbate the physical problems to access. So a shortage of providers in rural areas or lack of transportation to be able to get to those providers in a widespread geographic region can all have a, a major negative impact on individuals' health. When I, I think it's helpful um, because these are complicated and abstract topics to you know, tell, a, tell a short story if I, I have a, a minute or so um, about an access problem. So we had a patient who's on dialysis coming in and out of the ED a lot. And his barrier to getting care and getting to dialysis treatment and then to being discharged from the hospital was because he was wheelchair bound, but did not have a ramp. There was a, just a little thin board of plywood outside of his house. So it wasn't safe for medical transportation to pick him up. It wasn't safe for the hospital to discharge him to his home. And so that um, the need for repairs on his home was a major barrier to accessing care and causing him to repeatedly end up in a crisis situation. Other barriers can be uh, linguistic or basic health literacy and not understanding how to manage your own conditions and all these things, not being able to access primary care, primary prevention, secondary prevention, basic health screenings, again, means that people end up waiting to go to the hospital until they're really sick. It's a recipe for a sick population uh, who are ending up in the ED because of a crisis. Wow, that's really a poignant story, and I think it's a it's a great way to really drive home this connection between even how your home is laid out, how your home is is um, built, and and being able to get um, to a healthcare provider. Uh, thanks for that, Kat. I will turn it over to Isabel to answer. Thank you, and thank you both for what you shared. I definitely. Um have seen examples of some of what you shared with working with families at our school. Um, definitely have seen the impact of access to care on just overall wellness and overall 
um, ability to kind of show up and provide for, for students um, and also have seen some of those barriers to access um, and have had many conversations with families about barriers to access, which is what kind of drives our work in trying to think about what, how can we build partnerships um, with different programs or bring those programs directly into the school. Um, I know Kat just mentioned some of these, but some of the things that definitely are top of mind are transportation, um, personal experience with healthcare providers, maybe having had a negative experience with a healthcare provider or an inconsistency um, with the healthcare system, even capacity for scheduling visits, whether that's a family, um, you know, like balancing the school and work schedule and being able to fit into the schedule of a healthcare provider or the capacity of that provider, even some of the providers that we have partnered with our school have like a particular capacity for their caseload. And so then we have students that may not be able to access that um, service because we are at capacity. So looking into expand what we're able to offer um, is, is important and it also just requires more effort and more resource to be able to do that. Um, another piece is just awareness of the resources that are available and also the changing landscape of those resources that are available, especially after this past year, there's several businesses or providers that have either changed what they're offering or maybe are no longer offering um, what they were doing, so. And those can be hard to keep up with, as you're saying, when, you, when you're balancing so many things, when you're balancing work and, and kids and, and other kind of outside of, of work items. And, and, but it's important to know what's available, what resources are available to you because you know, no matter how much we do in terms of just um, changing policy and influencing policy, if folks don't know that those policies have changed or made resources available to them, then we'll still um, have some of those pending uh, barriers to care. Thanks so much for that, Isabel. Uh, Kat, your organization provides healthcare in a diverse rural region, which is not some, something we hear about often, rural health. What are some of the unique barriers to accessing healthcare for people on the Lower Eastern Shore? And what is Tidal Health's approach to these challenges? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, so I would say that in our region on the Lower Eastern Shore, our uh, unique barriers fall in to four main buckets. So a healthcare professional shortage situation, transportation, culture and language, and then technology. So I'll touch on each of those things and then talk about some of the innovative strategies that Tidal Health in partnership with our community-based organizations is applying to try to address those buckets. So um, with the healthcare professional shortage area, um, that really involves trying to recruit more providers to the eastern shore. It's a it's a problem to access and a problem for health on the shore because uh, of the length of time it can take for people to get an appointment with a provider, especially with a behavioral health provider or with a specialty care or specialist. And then the geographic region is very widespread. So you have a long length of time to get an appointment, but then you there's no public transit to speak of. There's some medical transportation that's very limited and specific who can access that. And then there is a bus service called Short Transit, but it's not conducive to meeting the public's needs with regard to seeking medical care. And then the ambulance and EMS service becomes a, a transportation service, unfortunately. I know that 15% of the population of the city of Salisbury alone does not have a vehicle. 14% of the people who live in Princess Anne in Somerset County, which is arguably one of the poorest counties in the state of Maryland, do not have a vehicle. Just last week, a nurse uh, reached out to me because there are patients in Crisfield, which is the southern tip of Somerset County on the Tangier Sound, uh, their patient couldn't get an MRI, couldn't get CAT scans, couldn't get a mammogram, because all of those services are in Salisbury, and Salisbury is essentially the hub. It's a city of about 30,000, but that's almost an hour away. We've got about 200 residents on Smith Island, and that's only accessible by boat, and it's home primarily to watermen and women who, um, who are either self-insured or don't have health insurance, operate in cash, and they they don't have a way to regularly leave the island to seek primary and preventative care. 
We've got a growing Haitian population that's estimated to be between five and 7,000 people now, many of whom are working in the poultry industry. And then um, there's a, you know, a whole other set of understanding cultural and linguistic barriers to accessing care and whether we have enough providers that are sensitive to those needs in this area. And we really learned a lot about these barriers during COVID and built new partnerships, especially with the poultry workers and our Haitian and Spanish speaking um, residents. We learned that there were sometimes issues with just the way that people were asking questions um, to get information and confirm identification when they were presenting for their COVID vaccination appointment. So um, trying to educate the people who are working the registration stations that, um, that to have some more flexibility and understand that even that could be a sensitive question to some people and that they may be using a different name with their employer versus what they would use in an electronic medical record. Also, when um, the vaccination effort kicked off people could only make appointments online. And with very little technology, that's the other bucket, lack of internet access, um, maybe a quarter of our population doesn't have any access to internet, then how are you supposed to make an appointment for COVID testing or for COVID vaccinations? So we worked with our community partners with volunteers to go out in the community and and make appointments on, by pen and paper and then take that back into the office to plug it in for people. But with when you live in an area that's rural and has very limited resources and, um, and organizations to work on these things, it's so important to work together and to collaborate across sectors. The Lower Eastern Shore is very interesting. Um, the COVID brought out the best in people and uh, we established this Lower Shore Vulnerable Populations Task Force. It was spearheaded by a, a nonprofit, Tri-Community Mediation, and now involves maybe 60 or more partners from various organizations and communities and neighborhoods all coming together week after week to talk about vulnerable populations and the impact that COVID's having and now continues to have. And how do we continue to um, work across lines to have a healthier community and address social determinants of health barriers? So that when an individual, regardless of their race, their background, their language, comes to an organization that there's no wrong door and that everyone in the community working for the community is aware of the resources and who they can connect someone to and make warm handoffs. So we have a number of sort of cross sector um, multi and interdisciplinary teams and regional approaches to try to address some of these barriers. We partner with EMS and the fire department on a community paramedicine program, a mobile integrated health program where a paramedic from the fire department goes out with a nurse into the home of people who've been calling 911 five or more times in the past six months to provide that care coordination and, and, and work with a community health worker who can um, sort of meet people where they are and address uh, chronic disease education and social determinant of health barriers. We're also doing mobile health screenings and uh, on medical vans or just at a booth at um, area events with the community and in churches. And then partnering with home repair and home building organizations like Chesapeake Housing Mission and Habitat for Humanity to um, build wheelchair ramps, such as the, the patient that I gave an example of earlier or to um, repair homes of low-income individuals who have asthma, have someone with asthma in their home, um, working across the region on a on crisis stabilization, on Narcan, uh, expanding access to Narcan and education. So all of these things are, are key to addressing the gaps in, in access and uh, meeting people where they are. Uh, that was really great the way you guys break down the silos um, of services and, and work together to accomplish the common goal of improving access. Um, and for those who may have missed it in the chat, we have dropped um, 
a, a link to MedSEP's report on challenges and opportunities for Eastern Shore residents, um, which discusses barriers to care. Uh, speaking of barriers, thanks so much to Connie. I'm glad we were able to work through some technical difficulties. Um, so please take this opportunity to um, introduce, introduce yourself um, a little, but then if you could speak to um, the evidence that immigrant families are op often forego needed health care for multiple reasons, and how can we break down the barriers to care to support immigrant and working class families? Thank you so much. Uh, I'm so sorry, I'm, I'm a little late. Yes, we had some technical difficulties, uh, but my name is Connie Serrano. I am a research and policy analyst at CASA, but I also lead all of our healthcare policy work. And so um, we are the largest immigrant advocacy and service organization in the Mid-Atlantic region. And we've organized over 120,000 black and Latino immigrants and working families across all of Maryland. And recently across the whole country, we just went nationwide, which is very exciting. Um, and our members this year actually uh, identified that their number one priority was healthcare. And so I'm here to speak a little bit in regards of the immigrant experience in Maryland um, and how we can improve the lives of immigrant communities um, through policy and advocacy, because we do know that immigrants do have the lowest amount of um, services and resources when it comes to healthcare. Um, currently in Maryland, there are over 350,000 people who are uninsured. Um, and that was data from 2019. We know that that number might go up because of COVID. A lot of people lost their jobs. A lot of people lost their coverage through their employers. And the unemployment rate has doubled in the state. And so we know that that will go up. Um, but really COVID just kind of highlighted the disparities that were already there. Um, undocumented immigrants do not qualify for public health programs. So they do not have access to things like Medicaid. They do not have access to things like the Affordable Care Act. Um, women do not have access to CHIP. Children do not have access to CHIP. And so um, because they don't have access to any of these things, they do rely a lot on the federally qualified health centers, the community clinics, which often are extremely overly working these communities, right? Um, just in Prince George's County, we do have four of them. However, the need is so large that even though there's four of them, there's not enough of them to just see everyone that needs that type of service. And so what is what ends up happening is that a lot of these communities are here for a large amount of years and they only see a doctor maybe once or twice in their lifetime. And so, usually they wait until their health is so bad that they have to go into an emergency room. And that leads to a lot of medical debt, which then can lead to housing insecurity, food insecurity, loss of income. And so we're seeing that preventative services are really key to making sure that these families are being served and that they don't end up in this much debt, that they don't end up this sick. Um, we saw during COVID that some of the most impacted communities were immigrant communities. Um, Prince George's County has the largest uh, population of undocumented immigrants. And even within the county, we saw that they had the largest number of cases and the largest numbers of deaths. Um, and so access to care is extremely, extremely crucial, not only for those communities, but for all communities, because we're all impacted at the end of the day. Um, and so preventative services are key to prevent diseases. Um, to prevent disabilities, um, to increase the quality of life, which we know that immigrants already don't have great quality of life, right? They already are working mm -hmm. three, four jobs and a lot of those jobs are physically extremely demanding. And so um, it increases the life expectancy as well. We know that immigrants are essential. They were essential during the pandemic. The country was kept running because of immigrants. And so it really is extremely crucial for them to get the services to care that they need. Thank you so much for that perspective. We're definitely glad to have you here um, to share that information with us. Immigrants are definitely, as a whole, um, a vulnerable population. So it's important to break down some of those barriers whenever we can. I would say this past year and year and a half has brought a lot of changes for so many students and their parents. Even before the pandemic, there was a critical need for mental health services and access to care for so many young people. Isabel, can you give us insight into the specific challenges they face from your perspective and what has made a difference in their lives? Absolutely. Um, so my position, again, is situated within a school and involves a lot of communicating with families 
um, and building partnerships and connections to resources for those families. Um, and also working with teachers and school staff to kind of respond to the needs that have been uplifted by those families to teachers. So um, building a lot around what we hear from families as I've said. <laughs> um, so yes, absolutely. This past year, we heard a lot about the different, um, the changes that families experiences, a lot about loss, a lot of um, need for adaptation and collaborative so solutions coming from partners, the school and families working together. We know a lot of families experience change or loss in employment and the benefits they receive through their, through their jobs. Definitely a lot of change in housing stability. Um, and, and just in being out of the school for over 15 months, the, source, the supports that are available through the school. So that's you know, the actual academic instruction for their students. Um, in some cases, the IEP or special ed resources and services that those students provide had shifted because again, they were out um, working virtually. Um, the food supports that are available through the school and school system, the social and emotional health supports that are available through the school and school system, that being family workshops and kind of school-based organized workshops, but also um, working with our school mental health team and receiving direct mental health care and services through that team. Um, and then, of course, um, yeah, those, those are some of the some of the law, loss and experiences we heard about, um, which, of course, all have an impact on student mental health, family mental health and their broader physical wellness as well. Um, some of what we again, some of the barriers that we've heard about in accessing that care um, were transportation, as we talked about earlier, um, ability to access those providers and the provider capacity. Um, within the school, I think one of the strengths, one of the solutions and things that's working for families is having that connection to the school and knowing there's a team of people that can help access resources. So we have two um, members of a community school coordinator team. We also have a Judy Center in our school, which provides resources similarly um, to the, the community school team um, for families with children who are birth to five years old. So there's a lot of support within the school just to think about how we're accessing resources and build those connections to um, what's going on in the city. Um, some, of, um, some of what we have within that school team uh, that's working is we have two mental health consultants, a social worker, a part-time guidance counselor, a deaf and hard of hearing program. We build an eye exams. There's a vision and um, hearing screening that happens in the school. There's free meals and snacks for students. Um, and we do a lot to respond directly to the community needs and interests that are lifted up from the school. Thanks for that. The school can be a great touch point. Um, I know uh, Governor Hogan spoke about that yesterday when it comes to vaccine rollout. Um, he, he and his team had spoken about that um, in the press conference. So really appreciate kind of the difference that the schools can make in the lives of, of the children and not just in the academic sense. So overall, Maryland has made continued progress in increasing access to care since signing on to Medicaid expansion almost a decade ago. Uh, Vincent, I know you have been a part of a lot of this work as an advocate. What are some of the other key recent policy changes that have helped keep Marylanders healthy? And what do you see as the next steps to make it easier for people to get the care they need? Well, thank you. And thanks again for including me. I want to uh, give a shout out to Kat. She's one of the reasons the uh, Affordable Care Act works in Maryland. She was helping sign people Amen up to on that. The <laughs> Eastern Shore. So thank you very much. Uh, Kat, and uh, it's our pleasure to work closely with Coney and CASA. I'm thrilled to hear you're going national. The country can benefit from CASA around the country. Uh, we believe strongly right. in care for undocumented immigrants. Um, well, Maryland has made a lot of progress. As I said earlier, under the Affordable Care Act, uh, President Obama's great law, we've reduced the uninsured in half from 13% to uh, 6%. Over 700,000 people were uninsured a few years ago. Now it's 350,000 by, by uh, estimates, um, which, which is great. And under uh, President Biden and, and, and Vice President Harris, we passed this year the American Rescue uh, Plan Act, which is increasing subsidies uh, for folks on the Affordable Care Act. So as of November 1 next week, uh, open enrollment, there'll be a lot more subsidies. So that, it's gonna help even more people get healthcare. And we've also done more in Maryland. We've adopted a reinsurance program, which has reduced premiums under the Affordable Care Act dramatically. And, and that's how people afford healthcare. We created the first in the nation prescription drug affordability board, which other states are, are emulating, which will make high cost drugs more affordable. And in 2019, we also enacted an easy enrollment program, the first in the nation, which at tax time you're asked, are you uninsured? If you say yes, 
will connect you to get insured. And that's gotten thousands of people insured who weren't yes. before. And our wonderful Senator Chris Van Hollen has introduced national easy enrollment legislation and other states are following our lead. That's all been great uh, progress up till now. This year in 2021, uh, three new laws were enacted, which we're working on making sure are, are, are fully implemented, which I wanna talk about for a second. And all of you can, can certainly help us get the word out. One is uh, put in by Senator um, Jim Rosepep and Delegate Lori Charcutian, extends the easy enrollment to unemployment insurance time. So under this law, when you file for unemployment insurance, you'll be asked, are you also uninsured? And if so, be connected to the exchange to get health care. That will not in effect yet, but it will be soon under this new law. So we're very excited about that. A second uh, great new law to build on the Affordable Care Act and the uh, American Rescue Plan Act by Senator Brian Feldman and Delegate Ken Kerr provides for two years, $20 million a year in additional subsidies for low income young people between the ages of 18 and 34. And I just wanna say, I wanna have a big shout out to the Maryland Health Benefit Exchange led by Michelle Everly, which is one of the best, if not the best exchange in the country. They're responsible for a lot of the success we've had so far, and they're implementing this new law very, very well. So as of November 1, Marylanders who previously went to MarylandHealthConnection.gov and thought, well, I just can't afford this, should look again. Uh, because uh, there are going to be new subsidies, but the federal subsidies and the state subsidies. Let me give you an example. A 30-year-old uh, uh, young person uh, making about 30000 a year is now spending about $70 a month on their gold plan under the Affordable Care Act. As of November 1, that'll be $1 a month. $1 a month. And that's wow. the kind of new subsidies that are available. We're working to get the message out. We're going to be doing events with uh, local leaders, and we're going to really working very hard to get the message out about the, these new uh, new subsidies. And my colleague Stephanie Clapper can put in the chat a toolkit that you can spread out, and it has a flyer and everything. So get the word out through your networks. As of November one, everybody who's uninsured should go to MarylandHealthConnection.gov and find out how they can get healthcare coverage. We also know that beyond healthcare coverage. We need to address health disparities. Health disparities are a huge problem in our state and across the country. Um, uh, uh, thank you, Callie put up the, uh, the toolkit. Thank you very much. So the health disparities, we know there are zip codes very close to each other where, where, where the average life expectancy is much lower in a predominantly person of color zip code the, uh, compared to the predominantly white zip code. That is unconscionable and we must do something about it. In 2012, um, under uh, then Governor Martin O'Malley, Lieutenant Governor Anthony Brown, a law was enacted creating health enterprise zones. Five zones were created across the state where money was put into those areas to reduce health disparities, implementing plan that the community came up with. I want to emphasize that the community came up with too. And they worked, I, as Kat mentioned, transportation. One community in Southern Maryland got money for transportation, to help get people to their uh, uh, to their doctors. In, in Anne Arundel County in Annapolis, they put a, a, a health center in a uh, public housing complex and that got people healthcare. Unfortunately, that program was allowed to lapse in 2016. Under leadership of Senator Anthony, State Senator Anthony Brown and delegates Eric Barron, who's now our US attorney and delegate Jazz Lewis, we have created the health equity resource communities, which builds on the health enterprise zones. I want to really thank um, uh, 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 Chairman Guy Gazone of the uh, Senate Budget and Tax Committee for what he did to make sure that over the next five years, these health equity resource communities will have $59 million to provide ways that local communities can build their own plans to reduce, um, reduce health, health disparities. And right now, Right now, there's a request for proposals out there by the Community Health Resource Commission uh, uh, that chaired by former Senator Ed Casemeyer, the director is Mark Luckner. They're doing a great job of implementing this. Right now, something called the Pathways, where people can file for, uh, re respond to requests for proposals, apply for grants they have until December 7th. So you should go to that website, Community Health Resource Commission. And in fact, if you're in Baltimore, there's a form about that, a COPPIN, uh, stay today at at 4:30, and you can go on that website and find out where you can go and find out more. You should, if you think you have a way to reduce health disparities, you should apply. And in 2023, that'll build more into health community uh, 
health equity resource communities across the state. There's a lot. Uh, uh, thank you, Callie, for putting up the, the pathways uh, link. So people yeah, thanks so much, Callie. <laughs> yeah, thank you for both those, Callie. These are two great new measures. I don't want to take too much time here, but let me just close with this. Even after all this, there's more we have to do. Two things we're going to have to do after we implement all these. One is address the problem of undocumented immigrants getting health care. We plan to work closely with CASA to, to make that happen. And second, there's a program we want to enact called auto enrollment that we've learned from Stan Doran at Families USA so that everybody who's now uninsured and eligible for free health care should be enrolled automatically, subject to them saying no, but we want to enroll people and get health care. And together, we can go from 6% to zero uninsured in Maryland. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Laird, for having me. I really appreciate that. You know, I mean, every time I, I hear you speak, I feel like I, by myself, could just solve all of these problems with a Maryland flag flying behind me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna take this brief moment to collect myself and remind everyone that this is a great time to put any questions you have in the Q&A um, section in this part of the Zoom. Um, so that the panel can, can address any questions that attendees have. And we're gonna switch gears a little bit and we'll start, so we'll start taking questions from the audience. And as we're doing that, we just heard some great thoughts from um, Vinny and DeMarco about some key policy changes that would help Maryland families, some opportunities that are available um, for organizations to apply to, to help um, Maryland families as well. I'd like to ask each of the other panelists to share one or two policy changes that they think um, are critical to addressing gaps in access to care. And Kat, we will start with you. Well, I'm very inspired, <laughs> Benny. And um, just so y'all know, uh, a number of partners have come together on the Lower Eastern Shore, and we are going to try to become a health equity resource community. We are um, well on our way to working on our application. And if there's Perfect. anyone on this call who is uh, an organization or inspired uh, and wants to do, uh, partner in this work, we are inclusive and open to new partnerships. So please reach out. Um, but as far as other policy changes that would help address the issues that we've been talking about, um, I look at it in terms of trying to work with the payers, the health insurance companies, the MCOs, managed care organizations, the Medicaid, Medicare on alternative payment models for some of the solutions that we are um, that we have evidence showing the impact. We're showing reductions in readmissions, reductions in ED visits, reductions in cost, uh, improved health outcomes with using community health workers um, with uh, having this community paramedicine nurse and paramedic program operating, but we're trying to have these conversations with the different insurance companies and show them the evidence and try to get support um, because we believe that, that that needs to be a stronger partnership and there needs to be policies to support that uh, alternative payment model. Thanks for that. That's a great suggestion, Kat. Uh, next, I will turn to Isabel. Thank you. Um, one policy change that comes to mind for, for me and also those of us working um, Food Child First is just in, being able to increase the number of healthcare providers within the school, the school based team. Um, and some of that is maybe policy change in how funding is allocated to schools and how much funding goes directly to schools that schools have flexibility on how they use it. Um, I mentioned we have. One social worker, we have a part-time guidance counselor, we have a small school mental health team, but those resources absolutely need to be expanded to be able to reach our students. Um, and even you know, schools that have larger number of students need more than that. So I think being able to allocate the right number, right amount of funding toward those resources in schools will be really important. Agreed for sure. Connie, why don't you provide us any uh, policy changes that haven't been mentioned yet? Yes, thank you. Um, so actually there is right now legislation being drafted that would allow Marylanders, uh, that would allow Maryland to open the exchange to all of Marylanders, regardless of immigration status, which would mean that um, undocumented immigrants would have access to Medicaid and the Affordable Care Act. And so um, we already know that this works in other states. We have examples. Um, there has already been policy that has 
changed the numbers of uninsured residents within their states drastically, uh, Massachusetts being one of them uh, who has the lowest uninsured rate in the country. And so there's definitely, we definitely need the advocacy and support around this. Um, and at the county level, we can also provide universal care options um, at the county level with the right funding. Um, Montgomery County is an example of this with Montgomery Cares. And I think there are many other counties who can um, expand coverage for people um, who do not qualify for these other services. Um, so I think those two are the big ones. Thanks for that, Connie, I appreciate it. And Vinny, any last thoughts um, before we go into the Q&A? Just that we, we want to work to implement these great laws that have been enacted now. And, and one of the things we're going to try to do next session is put additional money into the health equity resource uh, communities from the American Rescue Plan. Has given the state and local jurisdictions lots of additional money. We want some of that to go into supplementing uh, the grant so organizations like CATS can get the money that they need to implement their programs. And we're also working with Senator Katie Fry Hester uh, to make sure small businesses have the support they need to provide health care. Thank you very much. Thanks for that. Now I'm going to check in to see, I don't see any questions in the Q&A, but I want, want to make sure um, if there are any questions from attendees. On the meantime, what I would ask is, have you all, or have any of you seen a change in the landscape of access to care um, based on, within the past year and a half, based on COVID? I know for Bon Secours Mercy Health, a lot of those changes to access have been based in social determinants of health, um, especially food insecurity. We've seen a lot of that pop up. Um, folks are so you know, focused on that. They're not even focused on healthcare. Um, itself, healthcare services. Um, but are there any other in your specific communities, immigrant communities, rural communities, in the school communities? I know, Isabel, you had touched on availability of services in schools, but with the schools closed, those services no longer being available. But are there changes, do you think, to how healthcare is accessed or, or barriers, how those barriers have changed um, pre and post COVID? I can start um, since I kind of touched on that in the question you asked me earlier. Um, COVID just brought to light and exacerbated the disparities and the problems, um, the systematic, systematic problems that already existed. And that model of make an appointment, call your primary care doctor, get, go to the doctor for your visit and you will be well. That just, that's not most people's reality. People are poor. They don't have access to education. They lost their jobs, which meant they lost their health insurance. They never had to go on the exchange or, or access Medicaid before. And they didn't know how to do that. And then the government services and social services shut down. Uh, and so people couldn't access applications for the services that they needed. And so we found that we were one of the first, we had to shut down briefly too, but we were some of the only people able to go into the homes. And so our community health workers, you know, printed off all these copies for different social services um, that they knew that, that people needed. Um, and would take them over to the Department of Social Services, become a courier service and do the applications with them because people didn't have access um, to those services. And then we just saw the need, not just for, you know, for internet, but for tablets. So it was great um, that telehealth made so many more services more accessible, but, um, but that was, that didn't do a lot of good down here until MAC, our um, Maintaining Active Citizens, it's our basically our main aging uh, organization, and they offer a number of different programs. They got a grant, and they got tablets, and they told us about their tablets, so then the community health workers got the tablets and gave them to people and showed them how to use them and could preload with information. Um, and then you mentioned food, but interpreters and 
paying for that work, that valuable work of providing interpretation, um, not just for medical care and consenting to medical care, but to screen for social determinant of health and to educate, especially with um, our undocumented populations of what they, what they are eligible for and who could help them and how they could access. So all of those things um, helped us learn more about what people really needed and caused us to adapt and work much closer with a lot of different other organizations that I think the hospital and the health system didn't traditionally work with before. No, that's, that's a great point, this adaptation that's taken place and, and how that's changed the landscape even slightly. Um, anyone else wanted to provide any additional thoughts on that? We, oh, go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> um, no, I just wanted to quickly just piggyback on what I said earlier that, you know, this really brought forward a lot of the need for care within immigrant communities. We saw a high number of them, even our members talked to us that they would go to federally qualified health centers and they would be shut down because they were overly uh, populated with, with people who were uninsured already that they were giving care to. And so what ended up happening was that a lot of these people ended up just not having anywhere else to go. And that increased the level of mistrust that they had towards the healthcare system. Um, you know, what we hear a lot is, well, they don't want to see me or, you know, they don't want to take care of me or they, you know, and so it, it's, it builds a lot of distrust and a lot of um, what feels like resentment from these communities that they, they don't, they feel like they don't want to be treated. And so um, the, the other part too, is that a lot of these communities ended up not getting tested, not getting vaccinated because of this distrust. Um, in Gaza, we held a lot of vaccine clinics. And before we started the vaccine clinics, a lot of these communities, for example, in our location in Langley Park, were not getting vaccinated until they saw an organization that they trusted um, giving the vaccine and that's where they went. So building that trust is super important as well to make sure that these, that these communities are getting the care that they need. A great point. Isabel, I think you were going to add something. Yeah, I just had a quick follow up. Um, a lot of what Kat shared kind of resonated with our experience. We had health service providers in the school really shift the way they were working to be able to offer a virtual option. And then also we quickly realized that that didn't reach everybody. We understood the lack of digital access, lack of internet access. Um, so it kind of pushed us to adapt the way that we were communicating and also um, how often we were communicating through different, different um, strategies. So I feel like it was a good relationship building um, exercise, not exercise. It pushed us in our relationship building with families and also in our communication pathways. Um, and it, it pushed us to create opportunities for families to connect both with the school and each other to talk about the experiences they were having and then kind of brainstorm some solutions together as school community um, and be able to reach out to our partners to say, hey, we've heard from this number of families that they need X, Y, or Z. What can we do? What can we build around this, this thought? That's a great point. Just communication in general and, and some of these processes that are maybe not specific to the program itself, but can be applied more broadly. Um, those, those processes have cha definitely changed pre and post COVID. So, so thanks for that, Isabel. Now there is a Q&A that came in around the affordable um, the coverage plans through Maryland Health Connections for 2022 and the ages that are, um, that are addressed in those plans. So Benny, I will turn that over to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, um, the, uh, plans available for people as of November 1 open enrollment are for people of all ages. And um, in fact, many people of all ages are going to get additional subsidies thanks to the Biden-Harris American Rescue Plan. And one of the things they'll do is let people at incomes a little higher than were able, eligible for subsidies before get, um, health in, uh, get additional subsidies. So if you're uninsured, whatever your age is, Check MarylandHealthConnection.gov on November 1st, and you will likely be eligible for a plan you can, you can afford. The ages 18 to 34 will be getting additional subsidies based on the Maryland law, and that's what I was uh, referring to. But people of all ages can benefit from the Affordable Care Act and the new subsidies enacted at, at the federal level. So let me reiterate. Whatever age you are in Maryland, if you're uninsured um, as of um, November 1, uh, 2022, 
go to MarylandHealthConnection.gov. Now I know that does not include undocumented immigrants, unfortunately, and we support what Coney's talking about to expand uh, that coverage to um, uh, undocumented immigrants. We will work on that. But, it, but if you are um, a, a, a resident or a citizen and you, you, you are uninsured, go to MarylandHealthConnection.gov on Monday and you're going to see additional subsidies that can get you to uh, get the health care you need. Thanks so much, Vincent. I appreciate that. Well, I want to thank all of the panelists, since I don't see any more questions, thank all of the panelists for providing their insights today. It's really been great learning from you guys today, and, and I see that there are even some connections being made between attendees and panelists. Um, thank you guys for your time, for your insight, for your subject matter expertise. Um, and thanks to attendees to part for participating in this um, webinar today. I will turn it over to Ben to close us out. Uh, thanks, Siobhan. Uh, and uh, thank you to everybody, our panelists and to everybody who attended today. Uh, and for, um, uh, and please do stay in touch. Uh, you can keep up with the latest Maryland policy developments uh, and like the ones that you heard about today by following the Maryland Center on Economic Policy on Facebook or Twitter uh, and sign up for our email list to make uh, sure you hear about future webinars. Um, with that, I will uh, say thank you and uh, have a, a good and healthy day. <laughs>